Uh, hello, everyone. I wanted to welcome you to um, the Academic Engagement Network program on diversity, multiculturalism, and coexistence, featuring two very prominent uh, Israeli university presidents. I'll say more about them in a, in a moment. Um, uh, as uh, I, I'm sure you all know, these are difficult times in America on campuses where uh, there is a very strong anti Israel narrative that has taken hold among academics and even academic departments. Um, and uh, uh, it is something that my organization led by Miriam Elman and others uh, tries to address every day. Um, the, uh, uh, the format is uh, I'll introduce the speakers and then uh, we'll uh, you can submit your questions by chat and to the extent we have time, we're gonna we have a hard stop at one, one o'clock Eastern time. And, um, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and then we'll conclude in, in an hour. Um, the, uh, uh, when, I, when I was thinking about uh, today's um, topic, uh, and I think we have a lot to learn from the Israeli experience and we have a lot to correct in some of the narrative that is being bandied about uh, on American campuses, I thought of a quotation from uh, Edward Teller. And he said, a person, a pessimist is a person who is always right, but doesn't get any enjoyment out of it. While an optimist is one who imagines that the future is uncertain. And then he said, it is a duty to be an optimist because you, you can imagine that the future is uncertain. If you can imagine the future is uncertain, then you must do something about it. Well, I think we have two visionaries today who uh, wish to do something about that future. And that's why we invited them. Um, the, um, the bios are, are, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, they're extensive and impressive. And obviously you can look, up, look them up at your leisure. Um, Professor Ron Robin assumed his role as the 11th president of the uh, University of Haifa in 2016. Uh, I'm privileged to, to serve on his board. Uh, and I at one point I chaired the, uh, um, the uh, Academic Affairs Committee of the Board of Governors. Uh, he's had, um, he was uh, for many years a professor at Haifa. He also had a distinguished career in the United States at NYU as a senior vice provost. He's a graduate uh, from Hebrew University uh, with a history degree and then uh, a history degree from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Professor Daniel Kamovitz is the seventh president of the Ben-Gurion University of the Negev. Um, he uh, was a professor at Tel Aviv. He was dean of the Faculty of Life Sciences there. He's founder, very importantly, of a program on food safety and security. He's lectured worldwide on global um, food security issues. Uh, he studied at Columbia and at Hebrew University where he see, received his PhD in genetics. So I'm just gonna start off with, um, with one question here and then uh, please feel free to correct me uh, I have just enough knowledge of academia and Israel to be dangerous, but not accurate. Um, uh, in America, it is a massive theme, uh, developing programs that promote diversity, multiculturalism, inclusion, and the like. Um, and I, I wanted to ask uh, what your respect, I'm gonna start with Ron, what your respective universities are doing, and you might comment on the role of the faculty because the, the role of the faculty, I think Ron has said this, is at, at public universities in Israel is more akin to private universities in the United States. So it always influential, but perhaps even more influential than at public universities, broadly speaking, across America. So Ron, uh, how are you promoting the diversity and multiculturalism issues? And, and you might comment a little bit on recent events in Israel to see whether that has impacted what you do in some specific way. Sure. Um, good evening, good morning to everyone, depending on where you are. Thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, I'm sure I speak for Danny and saying that we're very pleased to be here at this forum. Uh, I'm actually gonna begin, Mark, with your permission, with a little story. 
This was uh, four years ago, four and a half years ago today, uh, when my wife and I returned from, from NYU uh, to Haifa. And uh, at the time, uh, we lived in the center of the Carmel. We arrived back around the high holidays. And if any of you have been in Yom Kippur in an Israeli secular city, uh, you, may, you may recall that the atmosphere says anything but somber. It's almost carnivalesque. In secular cities where the, there's no traffic on the roads, the stores are all cl closed, people go out in the streets on their roller skates, on their bikes and screaming and shouting, and it's actually quite fun. And so uh, high holidays roll, rolled by, uh, Yom Kippur came, we went out into the central Carmel, and it looked like any Israeli secular city, full of people having <laughs> kind of a good time, um, it is not unusual in, in these type of cities, but there was a difference. And as we walked the streets, I said to my wife, there's a difference, listen. And by listening, we heard uh, a significant difference. It was the amount of Arabic on the streets. Now Haifa has always been a very stratified city. It's a mixed city, Jews and Arabs, but it's always been very stratified. Um, Arabs living at the bottom of the mountain, Jews on the top. It has changed dramatically. It is still stratified, but it's stratified socioeconomically. And Arabs who have uh, achieved or have entered the middle class in Israel and the numbers are growing by leaps and bounds year by year, now live on top of the mountain side by side with Jews. And the reason for that is higher education. Uh, universities have opened the door and are creating a new middle class that is embracive and inclusive of all the groups that make up Israeli societies. It doesn't happen at the high school level. It doesn't happen at any level except at the universities. And it happens at, you know, at with different levels of intensity depending on the city. Daniel will speak uh, about, about his experience, but let me just say the following uh, about Haifa. As you know, we're in the north of the country and if those of you who may be a little bit unfamiliar with the dem dem demographic makeup of Israeli society, most Arab citizens live in the north of the country. If I look out of my office window from Mount Carmel, I look northwards, 50% of the population is Jewish. Were I to uh, remove the metropolitan area of Haifa, 25% of the population is Jewish. Meaning that the number of students who come from minority backgrounds at our university is very high. Uh, among our undergraduates, 40%, 40% of our undergraduates are either Christians, Muslims, or Druze. Uh, among our graduate students, that number falls somewhat, but it's still very impressive. It's around 30%. Were I to, um, to, 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 to look at the gender makeup of the, 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 those groups of students, it's almost overwhelmingly female. Even in departments like computer science, the number of uh, Arab students or is uh, overwhelmingly female. It's about uh, over 60% of the Arab students in even a department like computer science, which is traditionally male, has a large uh, female component. We are changing Israeli society by creating, as I just described it, the new middle class through the universities. Um, I think this is dramatic. And I uh, want to answer your question about recent incidents in Israel, Mark, by saying that we should not be distracted by, by, by noise. These incidents, however serious they are, and they were very serious this time, do not um, diminish in any form or fashion the level of change that is happening in Israeli society. It's long-term change and it will take time, but I can assure you that what is happening at universities um, will have dramatic effect on Israeli society as we move forward. We are very diverse. The universities, as you will hear from my colleague, take uh, very aggressive steps to make sure that we have a diverse student body and a diverse faculty. Each university does it a little differently uh, from others. Um, and we, just to give one example from our university, we have a very ambitious program in social mobility by which we um, seek Arab students and recruit Arab students to socially mobile professions and uh, ensconce them both with financial and academic help and then afterwards, of course, with placement. 
all of this uh, in order to fast forward a process that has been part of Israeli society for quite some time. And it is the diversification of the middle class. It's happening in um, medical professions, but it's moving out of medical professions into almost every other field below our campus, as you mark, you, you may remember, as you enter the southern entrance of Haifa, there is a very large high-tech park where every multinational that you can actually think of is represented. Our students, our Arab students are uh, recruited uh, very energetically by this group uh, of multinationals who of course want a diverse workforce. And diversity, the way we see it, is enrichment. Whenever you have a diverse student body, a diverse faculty, a diverse workforce, you enrich society. And I believe um, that having a robust and very broad middle class uh, will have dramatic change on Israeli society as we move forward. And it's the universities that play the role of engine, of the engine of this change. And so as opening remarks, I will, I will leave it at that. Um, but of course I can elaborate on some of these points uh, as we move on. Thank you. That that was that was enormously informative and impressive, uh, Danny. Yeah, thanks, Mark, and thanks for um, everyone for joining us, and thanks for Ron and Mark for including me in this uh, evening or afternoon or wherever we are. Well, I want to start from the end of what something that Ron said, which is clearly important to remember that what you saw in the news a month ago was, without diminishing its seriousness, and I can go on to what happened on campus later. Um, it was so shocking to us precisely because the trajectory over the past decade has been one of inclusion and especially over the past year in battling COVID, um, Israel's COVID response was led by Arab nurses, Arab doctors, Arabs and Jews working together throughout the medical um, uh, industry, the services. And it was again and again and again showed on the radio, on television, um, the different populations working together. This was really the first national crisis that didn't differentiate between religion or, or self-definition. And it played out through Israeli society of all of us working together. And so the glitch of last month was particularly painful in light of the huge uh, gains that have been made over the past decade. And I, and I agree with Ron that those will continue to be made and it's higher education that's doing it. Now going back a little bit, um, it's, it's important for me to say that I am the result of, um, of accessibility or of, um, uh, what's it called? I just lost the word in English. When you accept people who have low grade, uh, affirmative action. Now you might say an American Jew, why would an American Jew be the result of affirmative action? The only reason I was accepted to Columbia University, uh, my SATs were in the bottom 10% of Columbia University, was because I come from a small town in Western Pennsylvania on the, new, on the West Virginia border called Aliquippa, where only 20% of my high school went to college. And the only reason I was accepted was because of this geographic uh, diversity, they didn't know they were getting another Jewish kid into to, uh, Columbia. But this points out, and it was the first time in my life that I was ever in the bottom 10% of a class. I didn't even realize I was in the bottom 10% until the first day. That when we talk about accessibility of higher education, what we're actually doing is we're not promoting diversity, we're promoting excellence. Because by private promoting the diversity, we are ensuring that we're not missing potential excellence. And the goal of universities, I believe, is to promote excellence, excellence in education, excellence in training, and excellence in research. At no point should we ever be making compromises, at least not in my university, on the excellence. But the excellence has to be defined as promoting it. And we promote it by not missing it. Excellence is not defined as what is your SAT score. Excellence is defined as potential and reaching that potential and not losing that. Um, and this is one of our main challenges at Ben Gurion University of the Negev, which is in Be'er Sheva, the capital of the Negev. It's really funny that we call it Be'er Sheva, the, the capital of the Negev. In all of Israel, from Ron Robin in the north to me in the south, is two and a half hours at 
you know, on a, on a good day, you know, so, you know, but we, we like to call ourselves the capital of the South, even though it's just a commuting distance away from Tel Aviv, one hour driving. Um, we have three distinct populations on campus. One is because we are, we have so succeeded over the past two decades at building a campus life, we are probably Israel's only destination university. America, Israel doesn't have colleges like in, in America where people go to, to have a social life, to make friends, to build a future. The only one that is similar to that is really is Ben Gurion University, a lot because there's nothing else to do in Be'er Sheva but the university. And because of that, we have, there's this massive student social life um, that builds around the university. And it succeeded so much that the best students from all over Israel compete to come to Ben Gurion University. This is both top Arab and top Jewish students who are trying to get away from their parents to build a new life with other students around. But then we have two other groups of students, and these are the first generation of higher education. These are the poor Jewish students whose families were sent to live in the Negev, in the, in the poor cities of the Negev like Be'er Sheva. And the other is Israel's poorest um, population at the bottom of the social economic um, scale, and that's Israel's Bedouin population. Often in the United States, you talk about the Jewish Arab conflict, and it's important to understand that within Israeli society, the word Arab doesn't really exist to define one group of students. One can talk about it in, in uh, at Haifa, but there, there is the stratification within Arab society between religions, between um, village, village uh, dwellers and those from the cities. And at the bottom of the totem pole are the Bedouin in the Negev. So if Be'er Sheva has 250,000 inhabitants, 90% um, of which are Jewish, 10% Muslim, there are also 250,000 Bedouin in small communities surrounding Be'er Sheva. And if 12 years ago, there were only 80 Bedouin students at Ben Gurion University. We're a university of 20,000 students. And today we have over 800. So this shows the challenge that we have. These are people coming in where Arab, where Hebrew is clearly a second language and English is a very far behind third language. Their parents cannot help them with studies often. The schools they're coming from are the worst in Israel. Um, that they are dominated by tribal politics, um, which is one of the big um, problems in, in integrating within Israeli society. Um, and there's also the problems of how they interact with the other Arab students on campus. So this is an incredibly complex situation on how to accept these students into the university, but from there, how to, how to assure that they will succeed and not fail out. Um, the complexities are, are, are amazing. Um, and as Wong was saying, 80% of them are women. Women see higher education, especially Bedouin women, as their ticket out of poverty, their ticket out of 10 children families. Um, this is where, this is, their, this is their one chance for the golden ticket. Um, because of this complexity, um, how trying to, you know, things can bubble over at times, and it did bubble over over the past last month during the, the recent crisis with Gaza. And in response to this, uh, last week, I appointed our first vice president for diversity and inclusion. Her name is Dr. Professor Sarab Abu Rabia. She's the first female Bedouin professor ever in Israel. Um, her father was the first Bedouin physician ever in Israel. So she comes from Bedouin academic royalty. Um, and she completely understands the conflicts that she has to deal with as a secular, secular Bedouin of the Abu Wabiya tribe um, who identifies as an Arab Palestinian Israeli within larger Israeli society. That's where the multiculturalism comes in. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to follow up uh, because I think our listeners would be very interested. 
uh, about what um, specific programs uh, you've put in place. I know because I'm on the Board of Governors at Haifa, I've seen a number of presentations on that subject, uh, you know, in terms of uh, classes, in terms of admissions. Uh, and, uh, but let me just put it this way. One of the issues on American campuses, is even when you have a healthy diversity and inclusion effort, there's a lot of self-isolation among students. If you went to the cafeteria, you know, the African-American students or other groups of students you know, might have lunch with each other and, and sort of hang out together. So uh, I'm going to start with you, Danny, on this one. You know, what programs have you, with your new leadership that you've appointed, what new programs, what programs, they don't have to be new, what programs do you have to address these issues of, of, uh, of academic performance, of admission, of social isolation, of, you know, you know treating multiculturalism as an, uh, as a, as a, a sort of, one of the engines in higher education. And, and as Ron points out, uh, something that probably is not happening very often in, in the uh, uh, elementary and secondary uh, education uh, schools in, in, um, uh, in Israel. I, I taught a class at Hebrew University and I was struck by how little my students who are overwhelmingly Jewish knew about Arab education and I realize that's a loaded term and there are Bedouins and Druids and all sorts of different groups out there. So what programs, Danny, have you put in place? What are your plans for the future? How do you deal? And how do you deal with, you know, the faculty issues one way or another having wow. an impact? How long, how long do we have to answer that question? Uh, I, I'll give you three, four minutes. Uh, all right, you there know, you go. I, Gettysburg think... Address was 220 words. You remember okay. that, so, I hope. In, so from an academic point of view, and I'm only going to deal with Bedouin students at this point because we have specific programs for the Bedouins. Within Israel, you cannot do, um, you cannot have programs that allow you to accept a certain population unless it's mandated by law. I can't change admission requirements for, for proactive admission of anyone unless the, the, the Council of Higher Education allows me to do that. So the Bedouin is one of the ones we are allowed to do it for, but we have a program where the freshman year is basically divided into three years. The first year, they just learn Hebrew, English, and, and math to, see, to get them up to par. If they pass, and it's only Bedouin students studying together with other Bedouin students. It's like a preparatory program. If they pass this year, then they all go into their sec their their real freshman year with the other Arab and Jewish students, but freshman year is divided in half, where they take half their classes first year, half the classes second year, and get special tutoring, all aimed at getting them through freshman year. Because our statistics show that if you get through freshman year, then you will graduate with a degree. So it's an isolated program for the first third of the year. And it's specialized only for Bedouin students and it gets the desired results. Um, in terms of self-isolation, uh, multiculturalism, um, our, we have one of our administrative workers, her name is Maher, she's in charge of marketing to Arab students. She's from the center of the country. She said the reason she came to work at Ben Gurion University was that it was the only university that she worked at in Israel where she saw Arab and Jewish students seamlessly sitting outside studying together without their being them forced to do it. This does not mean they're socializing together. At the end of the day, the Arab students, the Bedouin students wanna be able to relax in Arabic. You know, there's the culturalism going on here where, you know, you're, you're under such pressure during the day, you need to be able to to let loose with the people who understand you. I do that as an American in Israel. I socialize with Americans. I'm more comfortable with, Ameri with, with English speakers. It doesn't mean I don't like Ron, but he has a great accent, so I'll socialize with him also. But um, I'm, not, I'm less worried about the, them socializing than with them studying as lab partners together. Because if they're studying together, going through exams together, then they're learning about each other. 
Um, of course, we do have programs that promote this, but the, the, the studies are so intense, there's nothing like them working together to really get through what you want to have happen. Okay, Ron, do you want to respond that, yeah, about the I, programs and uh, sure. I have some more questions about that? Sure, let me, let me start with the issue of, of self-isolation, which is uh, definitely an issue on our campus um, for a variety of reasons, which you know, I'll just mention a couple. There are huge age differences between the students uh, who come from the Arab sector and those who come from the Jewish sector. A typical Jewish student is deep in, in his or her 20s, while the Arab student comes directly from high school, usually 17, some of them are 17 and at the most 18. And so there's an age difference. There's also a, a very significant cultural difference from those who don't come from urban areas. Now there's a significant part of the student body who comes from, who come from cities like Haifa or Nazareth, but most students come from rural areas. And um, uh, the move to the city and a Hebrew speaking city to boot and a Hebrew speaking university, it takes a deep emotional toll on many of our students. And we put a lot of effort into providing um, emotional support and psychological support for students who come in. It, it's also the first time that uh, young Arabs, men and women, meet without the prying eyes of the village uh, supervising uh, their, 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 their social life and their romantic life. Um, all of these issues are, um, tend to lead to self-isolation. I will add also, Danny mentioned this, there are pedagogical issues. Hebrew is bookish among our students. They don't speak it when they study it at their schools. So it's really bookish and it's difficult for them uh, to make that transition. Math skills are definitely under par. We go back to the school systems in the Arab sector, which are definitely under par. All of this um, does lead to an element of self-isolation. How do we address self-isolation? Well, we've experimented with the Jewish Arab Center, which we have on campus, where we have programs that bring Jews and Arabs together. Quite frankly, these programs are preached to the choir and it doesn't really um, uh, assist us in the larger scale of things in getting students to work together. The program that works, which we've been running as a pilot and now will become a very large university-wide program is an entrepreneurship program, which uh, we will not require students, but will encourage every student at the university to participate. During the course of this program, um, um, the final, the final um, uh, element in this program is a project that students have to come up with a, an app or any other sort of issue that has to do uh, with, with uh, um, a new idea that has some sort of market value. And uh, the teams are deliberately Arab and Jewish. And in this competitive environment, because it is a competitive environment, there are prizes for those with the best uh, projects, uh, we, we find um, that this is the best way of getting people to interact. If you put them into, let's say, a breakout room here on Zoom, if we were having a Zoom lesson, uh, if you would put them together on a, on a program that has some sort of um, um, competitive edge to it, this is the way to get people uh, to, to, to actually collaborate. Work on something which is a common denom denominator. Culture is not a common denominator. What is studied in the classrooms is a common denominator. And so um, we do have significant issues with breaking down social isolation, but I think we're making uh, some headway as we move forward. Mark, if I could throw in one thing here. Yes, sir. Where, where you know, the unexpected gain by COVID was that um, a colleague of mine who's in mechanical engineering, uh, when, we move, when we move to online teaching through Zoom, he all of a sudden noticed an uptick of participation of Bedouin female women in his class. Women who would never raise their hand in the classroom because they were embarrassed to stand out or they were embarrassed to, by their accent in Hebrew, all of a sudden had no problem chatting in a question, which increased um, the engagement in the classroom, which is something for us to consider moving forward. Okay, let me uh, uh, follow up uh, and, and uh, uh, I'll start with Ron again. 
one of the hot button topics in the United States is ethnic studies. And California has passed mandatory rules, legislature on uh, uh, courses in, in, uh, uh, in high school and, and, uh, and at, at universities, primarily Cal State University, but other, and, and as you know, Ron, a suggestion to the University of California. But the idea is that, I mean, if I were to translate it in these, these terms, it would be that um, uh, Arab students, again, I'm using it generically, yeah. would learn more about uh, uh, Jewish people, Jewish peoplehood, history of Israel. And so too, the, the Jewish students would learn more about presumably uh, uh, religion and culture and history and so forth in, in the Arab world. Do you offer courses like that? I, I'm not sure that it's a great idea. I mean, there are bitter fights about what's included. The Jews were left out of ethnic studies in, in, in California that caused a, a sort of counter revolution, some changes. I'm not really recommending it to you. I'm just asking whether you do it and what your thoughts are about it. So it's definitely not mandatory. Courses like that exist, but they're definitely not mandatory. And I think there would be great resistance from our faculty. You mentioned before the level of faculty autonomy in creating programs for their particular students in their particular departments. And I think there would be great resistance were we to, uh, um, to, to mandate such a thing. Having said that, um, there are um, uh, at least 12 credits, uh, some, sometimes as much as 24 credits of breadth requirements, depending on the department and depending on the discipline, where students are at liberty to take courses from a whole variety of fields. I kind of feel that it's not really an issue with Arab students being exposed to a Hebrew speaking university um, and being exposed in, in the classroom uh, to Israeli culture. I think they learn this very fast. Um, it is more of an issue among the Jewish students who uh, for them, uh, sometimes uh, the culture of the person living in a town nearby is totally foreign to them. So um, <laughs> Arab students pick up very quickly on, on, on the cultural differences and the historical narratives that, that, that uh, permeate Israeli society and are part of the ceremonies that we have on, society, uh, on, on campus. I think it's more of an issue uh, with the Jews, but it, there is significant faculty resistance to making this a requirement. It's more suggestions than anything else. Um, were I, um, you know, the, the undisputed king of the campus and could do whatever I wanted, uh, I definitely would require um, uh, Jewish students um, to, to take mandatory classes in, in Arab literature. Arab language, um, but that at this point, I think is a, a challenge, at least in my university, I can't speak uh, uh, for others. Um, but the way to do this, Mark, is mostly to get people to interact. And once people talk, um, they hear the different narratives and they get a sense of the different cultures. And that's what we're trying to do right now is to get as many people to interact rather than do this formally in the classroom. Danny, do you have any comments on this? I agree with Ron almost 100%, except for the fact that if I was king, I wouldn't do it also. Um, where, where we've been the most successful is exactly in forging um, interactions. For example, three days before the rocket started falling, we had one of the most positive evenings. Um, it was immediately post COVID pre-war and we had a university-wide first time ever iftal. For who, for those of you who don't know what an iftal is, it's because you haven't had an ethnic study class apparently. And iftar is the breakfast um, for the Muslims during Ramadan, where we invited all of the, Arab, the all of the Muslim, both administrative and academic staff, and all of the heads of their departments, heads of their uh, faculties, to join in together with a lecture from one of the faculty members about the significance of Iftar and the Ramadan for them. And it was just this incredibly moving evening where we decided that the next year we're gonna open it up also for all students and for them to bring all their families and do it all over campus at one time. These are the types of events 
that have much more of an impact than any class could have. And, but in terms of, but you need, we need to remember the complexity of Israeli society. Again, looking at it through the Jewish Arab prism does not do Israeli society justice. I have a PhD student in my lab who's Christian, who won't speak Arabic when someone from a village is around because she doesn't want to be identified with them. I, I just recently hired a new <coughs> chief executive officer to the university. And I was worried that I had hired a man rather than a woman because you know, I was working up with gender equity. But it ends up that in Be'er Sheva, they were more excited that I hired someone who was of, of Moroccan extraction. Um, there are issues of ethnicities within the Arabs and within the Jews, which are still so overpowering that to, to, to make it just at a simple Jewish Arab doesn't do it justice. That being said, where we are, and I think all, all universities are having a lot of influence is by a program that was actually initiated by the outgoing president, uh, President uh, Ruby Rivlin, where his program has said that we have to come to the, to, the, to the realization that there are at least four tribes in Israel. We have the Arabs, and that's a mistake because there's more than one Arab tribe. There are secular Jews, there are modern Orthodox Jews, and there's ultra-Orthodox Jews. And they all self-isolate. And if those four tribes don't learn to live together, then the country is in trouble. And so there are lots of programs both within the country for teaching about the tribes, so to speak. And this is learning about the cultures, both within schools and within the universities. Thank can, you. I, can I add a word to that, Mark, for me? Sure. So, uh, I first of all agree with Danny that re it's reductive to reduce this to Arab Jewish. It's absolutely reductive. I would say that the biggest issue in Israeli society, and definitely one of the issues that that powered and fueled the current unrest that we all see, are the gross inequalities in Israeli society, the huge uh, disparities in income um, that are glaring, and I think perhaps as bad as they are in the United States and one of the worst in the Western world. And that sort of, uh, <laughs> as Danny suggested over here right now, um, that, drives, that drives resentment and that drives anger and it seeds, and, and, and it's, it seeds uh, a, a disquiet in Israeli society, not, no less than the divide between Arabs and Jews and perhaps more so. Let me uh, pick up on something. Uh, Danny said, and, I, uh, and this may be a tough one, particularly when you're talking about the Bedouins, but uh, in this country, of course, uh, there's a big push to diversify the faculty and the staff. And, and, and of course, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a very, um, I mean, there are many, many groups, but to hire more African-American professors or more Native American professors or more women on, on faculties where they've been historically underrepresented in the faculty and staff. Uh, it sounds like, Danny, you have your work cut out for you if you have the first full, I think I understood you to say the first full professor of Bedouin descent, uh, who is one of your officers uh, at Ben Gurion. Um, uh, what, what about efforts there? And I understand the faculty hiring process, and this is true across the America. And, and around the world, the faculty has an enormous say on who those hires will be and what they fields they'll be in and so forth. Uh, any thoughts about that uh, diversity within the, the uh, professions on campus? So I want to differentiate between academic, the diversity of the academic faculty and of the uh, administrative staff, okay. um, two, two different issues. First of all, both Sarab, no, not that, sorry, Sarab's father, um, who was the first Bedouin physician who I talked about. And we also have, have the first Bedouin full professor, male, who was a professor of computer science. But both of them were sent by their parents at age 11 to go to Christian boarding schools where Ron lives in order to succeed. They were not a product of Bedouin education. 
Um, and so when we're talking about diversity in hiring, um, until there will be complete equity, the, you know, 20, you know, Arabs are about 20% of the population of Israel. Until there are 20% Arabs within faculties, we have another generation or two to go through because there's not that many people who are actually imagining academia as a degree. For the present generation, we're, we're already almost at equity in, me in the medical field or in the law field, because that was where Arabs, middle-class Arabs saw that they could have their effect. But academia isn't even something someone could imagine that they could get into. You needed a job and a good job that you could get a, you know, get a, get a, get a salary. Um, so in terms of equity, in terms of in equity in hiring, while we have rules in place to make sure that hiring committees are considering gender, are considering ethnicity, that there's as little we do uh, bias training, it's gonna take a generation or two or three until we reach that field. Um, in terms of hiring within the administration, and here much more needs to be done, but much more can be done. Here we have to be proactive because these people exist, but they may not be reading the Hebrew ads that we put in for the wanted. So that's why we hired this one officer last year whose entire job to make sure that all our jobs are published in the Arab press. And lo and behold, as soon as we did that, there were many more Arab um, uh, uh, applications for jobs and that's slowly changing. Ron, did you want to comment on this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let me do what Danny did now and sort of divide this up in between faculty and administration. As far as faculty is concerned, all of the universities, including the two universities represented here, are incentivized by the Council of Higher Education uh, to, to hire um, Arab faculty. They are given support uh, for a number of years at, at the expense of the Council of Higher Education if we find the right candidates. And so we have a certain incentive because it's for free and it doesn't cost us money for a number of years if we hire um, Arab faculty. So we've been doing this probably uh, a longer time than, than other universities and uh, probably have more Arab faculty than most universities, if not all. Um, and, and it's perhaps a little easier for us to do once again, because we live in the North where the vast majority of Arabs live and there's a very significant group of, um, of well-educated uh, uh, Arabs who have either had uh, higher education in Israel or, uh, or abroad. Having said that, Danny's point is, is worth mentioning again. Uh, we are talking first generation. Uh, almost all of our students, I would say 70% of our students are first generation in academia. And there's tremendous pressure from the family, not to dilly-dally in graduate school, but to get a damn job and supply um, uh, a decent income for the family. It's their children who are gonna be imagining themselves as professors rather than they, they themselves. And so it will take another generation as much as we try to speed this up uh, to go forward. We have, uh, I, I admit, we are not doing as well as we should in administrative staff. And uh, we have to be, as Danny suggested here, significantly more proactive in, in doing this and in getting um, administrative staff uh, more diverse than it is at this point. Um, our, I, Danny mentioned the uh, chief diversity officer. Our chief diversity officer is the Dean of Students. And therefore the administrators somehow fall between the chairs here and it's not really addressed in the manner uh, that it should be. We have a lot, we have a ways to go with administrators, but I think, um, we try and we succeed to a large degree with faculty and definitely with students. The big thing is to get our students to imagine themselves as being professors. Um, that's the main thing, that their dreams should change. Um, and that's what we hope to accomplish. Well, I wanted to underline that because at least I was totally unaware of the program to encourage universities to hire more, uh, to achieve more diversity in the professoriate. Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't think there are many uh, American academics who are aware of that. Let me uh, uh, 
change this uh, a, a little bit. And um, Ron, you're, uh, I guess you chaired the Council of Presidents. I can't remember the, yep. the name of it. Uh, and, and now you have a new government, Ron. And uh, without getting anyone in trouble, uh, you know, what are your expectations about what, if anything, will change or be emphasized or, or, or whatever uh, with, with uh, uh, the, uh, the, the new government in Jerusalem? Well, I have very high expectations. Uh, first of all, for a personal reason, the new the, 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 we have, uh, ex we experienced for a very short time, thankfully, a minister dedicated to higher education who was a, a very political man and um, uh, put the type of pressure on us, which led to my resignation as the head of the council, put the type of pressure on us, which I found unconscionable at the time. Uh, and we've now uh, resorted, we've now gone back to a previous system in which the Minister of Education uh, is responsible for us and chairs, at least nominally, chairs the Council for Higher Education. Personally, I have um, great respect for the new Minister of Education. Her name is Yif Acha Shabiton. For a personal reason, I know her well. Um, she is a graduate of the University of Haifa, all three of her degrees. BA, MA, and PhD are from the university. And having some inside knowledge of her and her understanding of education, she was also a professor at a teacher training college. Um, and so she comes with an insight into uh, the role of higher education that perhaps uh, previous ministers uh, did not have. I, I think this is great to have somebody in this position who understands the nature of the beast and can address our very unique issues. And I have very high expectations from her. Like any government minister, she is, of course, uh, driven to a certain degree by politics. That makes sense. She's a politician. That's how she makes her living. But she also has a, a deep understanding, a profound understanding of education, which and higher education in particular, which suggests to me, and I hope that we don't meet here in a year and I have to eat my proverbial hat, but it seems to me that we have a good chance of... Um, of, of having, um, we know we're at the beginning of a new five-year plan. In a year or so, we will launch a new five-year plan uh, for all universities. Um, and this five-year plan will try and, uh, will give us all a roadmap of the fields in which the government or which society feels that we need to put in our efforts. We know, for example, that anything that has to do with sustainability and climate change will be part of this uh, uh, five-year plan in both Danny and, uh, and, and our university is, other universities are busily preparing for the obvious, uh, just at, at a local level and a global level, of course. Um, but we have high hopes that the Minister of Education, if Achi Shasha Biton, will allow this process to be as, as clean of politics as possible. It will never be without some uh, political aspect, as it is not you. You, you remember your Board of Regents. You, you, <laughs> when, you, when you served in, 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 in the University of California, it is never cl clean of politics, but perhaps it will be a little better than it has been in the past. And uh, Danny, you, you, you're born in Pennsylvania, but I don't think you can take the Fifth Amendment on this question. What's your read on the new government? Well, I, I'm really excited for it because it's allowing, it's broken the taboo. And it broke the taboo that Arabs are a part of the government. This government headed by one of Israeli's right-wing ideologues. And uh, you know, Naftali Bennett, I, I know him. He's a very nice guy, actually. He's a, he's a mensch, as we would say. But he's also incredibly right-wing. And he has in his government the Ram Arab Islamic Party, which has never happened in Israeli history. So if we're talking about diversity and inclusion, this is a message for all of Israeli society, that we all have to find the ways of not only living next to each other, but of living with each other. That, that the Arabs are partners in the building of the future of Israel politically, just like they're partners in building our academic futures on, on campus. I think it's actually quite interesting, I just thought of this one, that you picked to have here the two professors who in the logos of their universities, have Arabic next to the Hebrew. 
Not every, you could go look at the logos at, at the other universities in Israel. Some are Hebrew and English, some are just English, but only Haifa and Ben Gurion um, insisted on having all three languages in their logo. And well, as opposed to On, which is almost uh, Haifa, which is almost 50% Arab, at Ben Gurion were only a little bit over 15% because there's not that large a population. Of but still, we want this is a, it's not that they can't read Hebrew or English, but it's for us to signify that they are equal parts of our community. Okay, I had more questions, but it is time for the Q and A. If there are, I don't see any uh, additional questions on chat at the moment. I was told uh, that the chat was closed by someone who wrote me a WhatsApp. The chat was closed. Oh, well. I, I see a hand going up. Uh, Stephen Gersoff, could I, could you uh, bring him into the conversation, take him off of mute? So, and he's, still, he's still on mute. Yeah. Can you no, hear no. me now? Yep, yep, we can hear you. Um, I was a visiting professor at Ben Gurion University, I lived there for three months in 1983. I went back uh, two years ago and the, uh, the change was absolutely dramatic. Whereas uh, the students and the faculty were mostly or almost exclusively Israeli and Hebrew speaking in 83, even though in the hospital, I had equal numbers of uh, Arab and the Hebrew and Jewish uh, patients and I operated on them equally, uh, there was a, a difference. Unfortunately, with the Bedouin population, when I was there two years ago, uh, there was a woman who was a second wife who was being beaten by her husband, came a Bedouin tribe, came for uh, counseling, but had to bring the 10-year-old son of the first wife to listen in. That, that's a real cultural problem. Uh, an observation on what you guys are talking about regarding education for the Arab population. I'd like to compare that with the indoctrination that Carrie Nelson uh, gave to an AEN lecture just about two months ago. And I'd like to see a compare and contrast article between the two of you showing uh, what you're talking about is my son, the doctor, what they are talking about is my son, the martyr. And I think it would be very effective to show the effect uh, of uh, the Arab population who get indoctrinated and go nowhere and the effect of education on uh, those Arab students at uh, Ben Gurion University. Um, my comments. Thank you. A another question that's uh, uh, now is on chat. This is the question. And uh, what are the issues raised by Arab students about their inclusion or lack thereof in the university? For example, uh, the commemoration of Nakba Day. I can address that question if you'd like. Sure. So one of the great um, demands that comes back often is, is, is political activity on campus. Um, Jewish students um, really use that opportunity for political activity on campus. It is something very much valued um, by certain segments within the Arab population. And so um, we have a, 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 an elaborate system which allows demonstrations on campus. We may be the only campus in Israel where demonstrations happen on campus. I'm not sure what happens at Ben Gurion. I shouldn't say we're the only campus. Um, the Hebrew University, I do think also, and I take that back, we're not the only campus. Um, but we have demonstrations on campus and really only Arab students use that, that opportunity. Sometimes Jews will have a small counter demonstration. It happens at um, specific times in the day at a specific location and uh, um, literature is handed out but our diversity officer um, um, sees the literature before it's handed out and she sometimes negotiates with the students about some of the language used in, 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 in those bulletins. And I would say that's an issue uh, with Arab students. They would rather have uh, un, unrestrained uh, political activity on campus, given the fact that um, uh, sometimes things can be volatile we have specific days in the week where demonstrations can happen at a specific location, which is quite central, but nevertheless, uh, not one where there will be unnecessary uh, 
bodily friction between students. And um, we do uh, negotiate with students um, about the, the leaflets that they hand out. It, ultimately, it's up to the students um, to decide. And students also have uh, opportunities to invite lecturers to campus. Uh, and as long as uh, political activity abides by the laws of the country, um, it will happen on our campus. We may be uh, on the extreme of this. There are other variations of this as we move along. But given the size of the um, Arab student body, we felt it was important to, um, to allow as much political activity on campus as possible. We're, we're almost out of time. Uh, we've gotten a nice invitation here from Professor Ellen, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. It looks like Kanoin uh, uh, from Canada. She wants to invite uh, Danny and Ron and me to uh, uh, Canada to do a similar presentation. Uh, uh, I'm willing, but uh, you have to speak with my colleagues and they're much busier schedule. Um, there is a question Excuse about- Excuse um, I'm from the United States. I teach in Chicago political oh, science. Okay and Jewish studies. And so the invitation is open to tour the United States with this and Canada. But thank oh, you, okay. gentlemen, it was just marvelous. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, I, 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 yeah, well, I, I, at least me breathless, Ellen, what can I tell you? Um, and and um, uh, one last uh, question, very briefly, because we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, is there anything you can do to promote ties with the K through 12 education space uh, to, to deal with and address the, the, uh, the, um, the, the relative segregation of, uh, of uh, K through 12 education? Danny, maybe I'll send that off to you. Education in general in Israel, excuse me, sucks, but um... The, um, we need to realize, again, the complexity that the education system in Israel is segregated by choice and by politics and not by um, imposition. There are Arab Jewish schools. Um, Arabs can register to send their kid to any, any school. But in 1948, David Ben-Gurion suggested that the political uh, expediency was that there should be an independent Arabic speaking school system so as not to impose our culture on the Arabs, an independent orthodox schooling system so as not to impose secular values and an independent secular system. Um, I don't, but what this has ended up causing is that the Arab students, even if they're at excellent Arab schools, end up at a disadvantage because Hebrew is the lingua franca. Um, but stopping that, causing having an integrated school system or having Hebrew being the basic language of learning is so politically fraught that it's an impossibility. Um, I mean, as university, prof I mean, I just, I, we do interact a little bit with, with high schools, but you know, the, the issues are so complex. What people do as individuals, I'm, I have too much to do within making my university function that I can't really put my emphasis on working with K to 12. Okay, we've come to a hard stop now. It's one o'clock and I wanna thank Danny and Ron for absolutely brilliant presentations. I, we genuinely appreciate it. And I think our audiences learned a great deal. We have uh, recorded what you've had to say. So it may be read back to you in the newspapers or at the next faculty Senate meeting, I don't know. Uh, but thank you, thank you. And uh, I hope, wish you all have, have a good, well, in your case, a good evening. And, uh, and uh, it's time for us to sign off. Thank you. Thank you for helping us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great day. Bye-bye.